Fire Service Data and Tech Talk. Hey gang, it's Eddie Buchanan and welcome to the Fire Service Data and Tech Talk. Uh, the topic tonight, we're talking about Data 101. So if, if you're in the fire service somewhere, you might be a chief, you might be a firefighter, anybody that's interested in data, but maybe you don't know where to start, right? Like it's it's sometimes difficult to figure out what, what happens first, where do I find this data, where is it, what do I do with it, why am I doing it? All of these types of questions, the purpose of this episode is to kind of give you some guidance, maybe some uh, idea of what maybe to, where to start, what to look for as you go, what are some resources out there that you might can lean on as you embark on this. So I want to introduce some of my guests tonight. I've got two great folks to, for this topic. I've got Captain Rick uh, Kassler from the Claremont Fire Department, who is uh, responsible for training, education, and accreditation there. Now, Claremont in Florida, they are a, CFS, a CFAI accredited department and an ISO class one. So all the, all the good things. Uh, he's a graduate of Valencia College and from uh, Barry University with a bachelor's degree in business administration. And he's been in the department, looks, looks like maybe a little over 20 years. Captain, welcome to the show. You want to say, say a good hello to the folks? Hey, uh, yeah, not quite 20 years. Um, I've been with the city of Claremont for 16 and then been in public safety and health for, for getting close to the 20 year mark now, which is, is kind of crazy as young as what I am. Um, I got started uh, right out of high school. Um, but uh, this year will be 16 um, with the city. And I've uh, been involved with accreditation since I was a firefighter. Um, that's actually how I got my start um, with data and with our assistant chief um, and found out that I have a knack for just looking at spreadsheets and numbers and um, seeing what how that tool develops into something powerful that we can use. And, and now to be part of that and come full circle um, in my current role, um, where we started back in you know, 2013, 2014, um, where I was just putting numbers together. Now I know why, where that is, and I'm using that information now as an accreditation manager and in training to to basically elevate our department and continue to push us forward where we're starting to be recognized for training. Um, just all of our programs, agencies are reaching out. What are you doing? How are you doing this? Um, and it's been kind of an incredible journey to see that from the firefighter's perspective now to an administrator's perspective of what can you do with that? Um, and I try to take a lot of chances um, with my guys when we have um, time and around the station, those tabletop discussions and have a reputation for being that that analytical guy that will take bits of information that we use on a day to day basis and present that to city leadership. Now that translates to funding um, for, pro, you know, various service delivery programs, whether it be surface water, whether it be our fire suppression training, justifying needs for classes, additional hours orientation programs, just about anything we can do in the fire service, we can tie back to those statistics. And then even furthermore, like with, uh, you know, CFAI, you know, we're being driven not just on our outputs, um, but the outcomes. So what is the outcome of all that effort and being able to justify that? And I think that that's the, the bigger key, um, especially with both of you guys, you know, um, being involved in the, the analytics side of stuff and the analytic platforms is, the why pushing pushing that information and being able to justify that to everybody um it's that it's that scientific side of backing up our stories backing up that that tabletop discussion and solving the world's problems at the fire station table um and translating that out to the public so that's why i'm really happy to have you on the show so um i think that's one of the great things about your experience is you've seen it from the firefighter level to an officer level and from the beginning of let's start to collect some information and then to the to the you know kind of reaching the pinnacle almost of of actual application of data i call it operational intelligence is the term i use all the time so very very excited to have you on the show and my other guest is michael moser michael is a uh he has served as a strategic data analyst and now a project manager for Deccan international which is a data analytics company uh he served has also served as a geospatial uh, uh, uh dag on analyst, a geospatial analyst for the United States Marine Corps. So um, tremendous background in uh, data and analytics. And Michael, it's awesome to have you on the show, brother. So glad that you're here. Too. Oh, yeah, I appreciate some hello. Oh, yeah, I appreciate it. I'm more happy to connect you two. And honestly, you know, anytime, anytime I hear a problem set like what we're going to talk about today, uh, I kind of always go with Captain Castler is always the first in the front of my mind to discuss everything that we're going to talk about today. And um, 
you know, other than the, I don't know about the tremendous background. I think I have a, a Captain Kessler said he has his uh, his uh, spreadsheet skills. I've got the ability to listen to people uh, and try and figure out how I can help them out uh, to get to their angle. Awesome. Well, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. Um, the, the, I guess the place to start with this conversation, particularly related to kind of data 101, is why in the first place? Right. And you kind of alluded to that already a little bit, but I want to expand on it some. Uh, if, if I'm a, a fire chief or a fire officer uh, out in, you know, somewhere in the middle of America, I'm busy, man. Why, why do I need to uh, put this investment or, or start paying attention to these to this data and start measuring stuff? And where would I even begin? How do you even start? I'll give that to, uh, to you, Captain. What do you think? Um, so I know when we talked about this, and, I, and this is, can get very long-winded on um, the different answers, and I think ultimately the, the simple question, you know, when we're answering that why is, well, what do we do? What do we get in this line of work, right? Like, what is our sole purpose as an industry and as fire services? It's for the citizen. You know, that's why I'm here. I'm here to serve the public, and it's the public. The public is our ultimate why. And then we start breaking that down into, well, why are we here to serve the public? Well, how are we going to serve the public? Um, what does the public need? Why do they need that? And we start answering and filtering that all the way down. So like for our organization, why do we exist? You know, we, we exist to provide, you know, an all hazards response, um, exceptional service in our service delivery programs, you know, and then we have, you know, expectations that were set through our strategic planning process, you know, that within, you know, um, a five minutes of us being dispatched and our trucks rolling, they want a fire truck, you know, our community expects that there is, um, a fire fire suppression based, you know, apparatus with, you know, at least three personnel, one of them being a paramedic, be able to deliver quality care or solve whatever problem that they have. And so those are the expectations. And then it c gets back to that. Well, why? Why do we need a fire truck to go on every medical call? Why do we need three people? Why do we need at least one paramedic? Um, why do we need a ladder truck? Why do we need four stations? And those are all the questions that our city manager and our city leadership, our fire chief, um, and even, you know, guys at the grocery store get asked that question, right? Why are you bringing the fire truck to the grocery store? And I think if guys, you know, and we really talk about this data, we get asked these why questions constantly. I know as a company officer, we got this. Um, I know my engineer, um, my, my previous crew got really good at asking these whys and, and explaining to the public and educating and how do we educate, right? We have textbooks, we have data, you know, you go to school, you have information in these books that explain the why behind everything we need. And so that that's where as a fire service in the public safety industry, we use those, those data points, those collection points and those bits of information to answer that question. The city manager says, Hey, why do you need a new fire truck? Or why do I need to order two fire trucks this year? Well, city manager, we're on a 20 year replacement cycle. We haven't bought a truck in two years. We have 10 apparatus between our six front line, our four reserve. And if you do the simple math, that means we have to buy a truck every other year. Well, why do I need to put $1.8 million away every year if I only need to buy a fire truck every other year? Well, if we do a calculation and say, hey, we know the cost of fire trucks are going up 10% per year and we're planning on that, I can do the math knowing that based on my stations and my trucks, my current inventory, barring that we don't add another station, that I can, I can map that out for the next 20 years and tell the organization that in order to be fiscally sustainable, I need this much money every year put aside whether we buy a truck or not. And that'll protect us, you know, moving forward. And so that's outside of the response time, but it affects everything we do whether it's training. Um, and then when we get into the response stuff, that's a, that's a whole other, you know, that's a whole other realm. So it can definitely get overwhelming. And I'm sure people listening are like, my gosh, where do we, so where do we start? Is we go back to the original question, why? Are you going through if, and, and that's where SIPSI and, and CFAI does a great job with the self-assessment, doing the community risk assessment, the standards of cover, putting all those programs together because it is that blueprint, it is that, um, I guess, checklist, um, if you will, for how to run a fire department, how to take in, and cover those every aspect of the fire service and give you um, a way to organize all those thoughts and then bring it and collect it 
And we, I think we focus a lot on the, the performance metrics and the response times. And I know that that was uh, with working with Michael um, and the deck and application that had a lot to do with it, right? Like the response times, but the response times are that pinnacle, right? Like that's, that's our response times. What's our turnout time? What's our dispatch time? What's our travel time? What's our time to those critical benchmarks, whether it's water on fire, CPR, AED, fire extinguisher, you know, aerial, all those, that's the pinnacle. That actually is the end result. That's the end result. And that's really the final output before we look at outcomes of everything else that I'm talking about, whether it's our trucks, it's our training hours, did this training program help, you know, how many CEUs, all that stuff culminates in we had a faster turnout time because we've been doing gear drills. We had faster travel time because we identified that this area was slow and we needed traffic signaling devices or different ways to do that or work with public works to, you know, open up a back gate that was previously closed um, or fix potholes that we had to slow down or get rid of speed bumps or, you know, what have you. Um, and then even to the outcome of like, are we doing 1710 drills? Um, you know, getting off the truck or are we meeting our effective response force for a particular call types, you know, in our risk levels, because we've added an additional person to our units. So we went from three to four. And is that helping us out? So I think our response times become the pinnacle and it's really easy for us to focus on that and not realize what got us to, to those response times. What do you think, where do we start? What is the most essential piece of data that every fire department should have access to? Like where, where do you go? Where's the beginning? So the beginning. Michael, what do you think? Um, so I think, I think the beginning is, is, is having records management platforms. Um, and there's different, you know, and, and there's different software, you know, for us, you know, we use a multitude, you know, we have vector solutions, which is really common across the industry for logging our training um, and certifications. Um, we've used in the past firehouse, fire programs, ESO, emergency reporting is our, our RMS systems for our reports. Um, and then we, you know, obviously we have our CAD data that comes from, you know, our CAD and is having a place that we can capture that. But more importantly than just having the repository to capture that information is having something, having training and having quality so that people understand that that information going into that and basically putting that that person, that person is completing that report, that person is logging the training, that lieutenant that's writing, doing that run, or that paramedic that's making sure that they click the right box and document their report, putting that information in correctly the first time is that first essential step. It's capturing the data. Because without capturing it, without recording, with basically without taking that selfie, like what we do on vacation, we're all, you know, we take the selfie after the call, we, you know, we capture our training, we capture the fun. If we don't capture that on the front end, we can't use it. I can't use it, you know, five years down the road when I'm trying to justify another station. Um, and so that's the that's the initial step for agencies and people that are looking at getting into this line of work and being able to justify every single thing we do with 100 percent confidence um, and, a, and, a, and a stack of um, information to support that. It's getting the is capturing the information. So putting it in correctly and having a way to capture it and pull it back out. Hey, Michael, what are you seeing around the country? Are, are, are fire departments, can they f get access to their CAD data okay? Or are you seeing that being a little hit or miss? Yeah, great question. Before I answer it, and you might have to remind me specifically, but there's, mm -hmm. a, I'd like to just put a bow on some of the things, Captain Kassler. I, yeah. I agree with, you know, everything he said about, you know, the why of helping people and helping the citizens and everything. That, of course, is 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 the standard, I think, right? Um the why get into the data world or why get take all this, you know, sometimes painful steps and time consuming steps. Sometimes I think the why is because it works, to be honest. I don't think the whole paradigm didn't shift towards this because it doesn't work, of course. Right. So right. I've seen it. I've just seen it for year, either in the Marine Corps or in um, at working at deck and, you know, working with, uh, you know, the homeland public safety, we'll say. Uh, I've just seen so many problems and or so many obstacles, I'll say, not problems. And I don't really ever, I can't think of one time where like, oh, well, there's nothing you could do really, you know, to help you be informed about that decision. And then the only other part I really wanted to add on to what uh, Captain Kassler said about, you know, being really confident in your decisions. Um, 
I met a lot of firefighters. I wouldn't say that many of them lack confidence in general. So how I always describe this is you already know the answer, I think, most of the time, right? I don't think anything I've ever, I don't think I've done any projects that I went into the meeting with, you know, the chiefs and said, this is going to be a huge curveball. It's not what you were expecting at all. It's almost always the the operational experience and intelligence, like you said, Eddie, uh, the the work, the professional history, the the reasons that the departments do the things that they do. Well, they do them because they work, right? So I'd say very often this is the math behind the decisions that what your gut already knows, right? So very often it's you know those stories you're trying to tell about budgeting for that truck or for you know, defending your budget or, um, you know, accreditation, all these different things, right? You know, losing a truck's going to be bad. Saying, do we really want to sacrifice a four minute, you know, travel or, you know, sacrifice these big numbers in this specific area where you live, sir? Is that what you want? That's a different conversation, right? To have the math behind you. And yeah, so just to kind of put a bow on that, it's, it's, it's a, uh, it's just the math, really. It works. It's the math behind what your professional history is telling you. And it's just a system of, you know, same way that Amazon knows uh, we get these packages in these places at these times. So we should do this. Same thing with public safety, honestly. Uh, so your original question to tie it back. I'm, I'm impressed with myself that I remembered there. Uh, the uh, it's, it's hit or miss. To be honest, it depends on the locale, it depends on the relationships of the human beings that are making these decisions. A lot of it depends. You know, I would say a lot, a lot of times that's someone else's job to find the data and give it to us. Some departments are really good at it. Some of them have zero access and, and probably won't for the foreseeable future because because that's ours, whoever we are, if that makes sense. So, yeah, it depends. You know, honestly, I would hope that. I haven't found the situation, I don't think yet, where I thought less teamwork worked out better for the public, but uh, it does happen. So I, I, I've definitely seen some struggles. And, you know, again, it's not always, uh, you, you have to have that starting point. Like you need some records, right? There's You're not going to make it very far without any records. Uh, but usually getting those records is not, you know, at the end of the day, whenever you're like, I'm trying to help people, people tend to help you. Yeah. And I think it's important that a, they have the access to the records, to their CAD data and, and whatever else is available. Mm -hmm. And then to understand how it's configured, yeah. because uh, when you're looking at uh, particularly volunteer uh, based departments, um, they can, it's not uncommon to see those units dispatched by station, mm -hmm. right? So you have station level dispatch. I actually wrote about this in an article for fire engineering back in April, uh, where we, we kind of talked about the the issue of station dispatch versus unit dispatch. Whereas if the station's always on shifted is the term they tend to use. If, if that station's always in service, but it doesn't really necessarily reflect the staffing, mm -hmm. All right. it's a completely different, it, it's just giving you false information right out of the gate. So I think that's one of the points I would send to, to every firefighter listening is that's a, one of the first questions you want to ask is, can I access my CAD data and how are we configured? Are we configured in a way that that shows us real capability? Yeah. But and, and by that I mean unit dispatch, yeah. specific unit dispatch, where uh, the engine is in service because it is staffed, right. <laughs> you know, and, and ready to respond, not not because it's parked in a building. So, I think that's one of the the key first things uh, to start with. Well, very good. Um, my next next thing to consider here. Um, what are the logical steps like and what what do you do first like like captain what did y'all do first when you started in this data realm what, what what was the sequence of events like how did you go from let me look at this spreadsheet and see what i can interpret from it to all the way out to being an accredited department i mean that that's a that's a big journey you went on like what were the first couple of steps you took a couple of missteps, right? Like we're anytime you get into this, right. and I think that that's the the first and foremost is it's going to be a dirty process the first time you get involved. Um, but the nice thing is there's tons of resources and people to reach out to, and and that's where I find myself now is is answering some of these questions. Um, but we started is we we went back to our goal um, when we first went into this is 
we wanted to become accredited. Like that was our next step is we, we knew that we were at the point as an organization that we were doing things in a manner that was consistent. And we felt that we were starting to um, become a, a trendsetter and a leader in our, in our area, in our jurisdiction. This was the logical next step. Uh, so doing that, we had to go back and, and basically go and take looks at our data that we probably and scrutinize it to, you know, like what you're talking about is like, what's the information level we've been collecting it. And we collected it and we reported to Enfers just like, you know, every other agency and it's a requirement. And we would look at our response times, but we had the, you know, to, like what Michael said is we had the, our, we knew what, what we were doing. We knew that we were responding quickly. We were getting guys on scene. We were managing these calls. We were putting out the fires. We were, you know, taking care of our patients and we were doing it really quick. And we knew that from from anecdotal evidence. And then we took that and now you start to compare it. But we found a few things that we probably didn't realize we had. Maybe it took a long time. I, uh, I sat sat down and uh, <laughs> like my light went off. But um, we, uh, we realized like there's going to be um, a necessity for us to, to look at, you know, let's say our dispatch time. And that was one of ours call handling, call processing times, just depending on, on where you're at of from the time you call 911 to the time a truck is rolling, you know, national benchmark industry standard is like, you know, 60 seconds or less. And we found when we first started venturing down this, it could take three minutes. And we're like, why are our response times so long when we finally started looking at from the beginning to the end? Why, why is this so long? what happened? We're better than this. And then you start getting down and you're like, oh, well, it's, it's this call processing time. And then it comes back to a system of, well, it's not the dispatcher's fault in the sense, but they did a system of in order to be able to dispatch this because we're dispatched by a different entity, they have to call and they have to find there's about four or five steps they need in order to be able to get the right truck going. And that was all, every bit of that was taking time. And what we were asking them to do for us may not have may have contributed to that. So then it, it prompted discussions at county levels. Um, and, and I think everything's been cyclical. We And then we fixed that issue. And then maybe we had a change, you know, new organizations, new CAD, we went through it. And we're actually going through that process now of, because we're monitoring things um, closely, that even our comm center is like, hey, we're noticing it's taking us longer to dispatch than we would like which means it's going to be longer than you would like. So we're going to look at this system again and see what we can do to make it better. Because at the end of the day, if we can shave 60 seconds off here, well, then that gives you an additional 60 seconds to get, you know, that we can apply that to our travel time or we're reducing that total call time. Um, and, and again, that's, those are some things that, you know, as a fire department, we typically can't control, but we can, con, you know, dispatch can control. Um, and especially for us, cause we don't, we don't control our dispatch. So that was one of ours. Um, and then finding out what you actually need. You look at that spreadsheet, like you said, you know, well, what is this time to that time? And what's an effective response force? I knew that's what blew my mind when I first got into this. I'm like, what is an ERF? I had no idea. I'm a firefighter. I'm like, what does that mean? And they're like, well, it's this and it's critical tasking and what's critical tasking. And I'm starting to throw all these things out. And again, it gets very overwhelming, but Effective re response force, if I was to equate it to a firefighter and what's the, the tabletop firefighter, it's how many guys do you need on scene to do that job? When we go to training and you like have two units and we're simulating ghost units and you guys get and you get worked and you're like, man, this was I'm so tired. But then you're like, you go to a structure fire and you're like, other than standing around and being, you know, that, that yard shepherd, you got the pike pole, you're standing there because somebody else is doing the job and you've got six trucks on scene. Well, that's that effective response force. It's how many people it takes to do that job. But I didn't know that. So you're like, well, what is this? And it just didn't get that concept. Well, why is this different? What's a low risk? What's a high risk? And that comes back to that community thing of setting those expectations of, so we've got the why, we're serving the public. Well, how do we break that down? Um, so we have fire, you know, and for us, like if we go follow the accreditation model, it's four broad categories, fire, EMS, tech rescue, and hazmat. And we can pretty much, if we all sit here, we can all drop any one of our calls into those four broad categories. And then we can filter those out of, well, what do we need to solve a car fire? What do we need to solve a car fire that's on the highway versus a tractor trailer or a car fire next to a building or an apartment fire that's protected versus an apartment fire with a common attic that's built before, you know, we required fire sprinklers. What about a fire in the hospital that gets beyond the suppression system? 
you know, it's a low risk structure, but if it gets beyond the suppression system, how, how much of an impact is that going to be to our community? If we burn a floor on our hospital, we have to isolate that. And so those are all those questions. And we talk about this all the time in pre-planning and those tabletop discussions, especially when we get the new guy, well, what are we going to do if that happens? And so we do that and then we collect that. And so we can actually show. And so we have those tabletop discussions. We have the stories. And then can we repeat that or basically show like, well, yeah, I was on that fire, you know, we're a small agency. So we might only run five to 10 fires a year. We remember those. I remember most of the ones while I was on that fire. And we got it. We got that out really quick. And you start looking, you're like, well, we actually got it out with only three trucks there. We never assembled an effective response force. Well, does that mean that we need to lower the number of personnel there? Or did we, because of all the other things that we did, we, we increased our efficiency. Um, and, that, and that prompts the discussion of, well, what do we need? How many people do we need or those resources? And, um, and how, do you, how do you articulate that you know, to guys? Um, and it's, we didn't need it on the next level, but conditions got better. What happens if they didn't get better? Do we still need the balance of that alarm? Does that alarm need to be dispatched initially? Well, absolutely, I would say yes. You know, and then we happen to, but if we needed more, then they were already there. How long does it take for our resources to get dispatched? And then that that obviously plays into that's how we figure out where our stations are going to go, where our deployment of resources are, CAD discussions of like, well, maybe instead of dispatching one of our stations, because we have four, that we dispatch one of our neighboring mutual aid partners station because it's actually closer than dispatching our own jurisdiction and then building those mutual aid partnerships. And then having some degree of reciprocity, because if that station mutual aid partner station is close to me, then obviously we're close to that. So that may be something where, Oh, Hey, in these high acuity calls, we respond together. Let me hop in for one second to answer your question, Eddie. So (laughs) I'm going to go real fundamental answer here. Like uh, if we were writing a textbook, I think probably how this would go. So we, you know, basically said, have data, unfortunately, you know, and Captain Kessler answered that. And then, the, you know, the beginning, what he was just talking about was, you know, uh, kind of not to do the Donald Rumsfeld, but what do we know? What do we not know? What do we not know that we don't know? All that type conversation, right? But I think the real fundamental answer, and it's a low hanging fruit, but, you know, it's got to be done, is do you trust what you have? Like, is it valid? Is it valid information, right? Or is it, are we missing half of our timestamps that say when we're going, you know, in route to calls or something like that. Right. So there's all the, and there's again, kind of like everything we're going to say here, there's levels to it. Right. Do you have your mutual aid calls? If you need those to help fulfill your ERF, do you have outlier, you have an outlier policy. You know, if you have something in your records that say you have a, a, a you know, five hour call processing time, which happens in uh, the data, right. Maybe not in real life, Someone just forgot to press a button. Do you, do you, do you, what's your policy with that? You know, how, how often does that happen? There's all these different levels you take it to, but I would say to boil it down is, you know, what we've said so far, get your records, figure out what you have, what you're missing, or, you know, or what you don't know, maybe figure that piece out. But then you gotta see if you trust what you have. All right. So again, you're gonna, and people are coming at different problem sets here of why they're getting into this realm, right? So not every path is going to look the exact same, but I think that's kind of the textbook answer is you're going to have to curate or, you know, define some outliers, make sure you have all the pieces of intelligence you need. You know, again, if you go down this whole route and this is a very specific example, but if you need, you know, some mutual aid help to fulfill some of your ERFs or EFFs, they call them different terms around the country. Uh, well, you're going to need to have that information. If you, if it's not in your system, we have a problem, right? So, yep. and, and this, to piggyback off of what you said, that was one of our biggest challenges as an organization, especially on the accreditation journey. And this is where Michael and I've got to work together closely, you know, over the past you know couple of years is we, because we don't provide transport, we don't own an ambulance and it was either a third party private, um, which then got absorbed by the county. And, you know, for us, like we, we would track our high acuity medical calls, but we might only have 40, 50 of those a year. So it's a, it's a little easier for us to go off the CAD data, find those, 
and then do those calculations manually. Um, but if I wanted to do our the bulk of our EMS, I didn't have a way to track how long it took an ambulance to get on scene. And there was multiple discussions. Why? Why does a fire truck need to go? Well, because it takes an ambulance twice as long because there's twice as many fire trucks as there are ambulances in our area. So it's beneficial to have a fire unit with a paramedic there because it can be there in half the time. Mm -hmm. And to explain that to people, well, that's the story, but I can't tell you how long it took an, an ambulance. And then I have to rely on some outside entity giving me information, which may not be comparing apples to apples. They may be using their time, not the initial call processing time. Mm -hmm. So we're using different information and to give everybody an accurate picture. So that was the big thing for us is to, to use a, a powerful analytics tool to be able to pull in data from multiple points, merge it with what we had a fair degree of um, confidence saying, this is accurate, this is our run number, these are our times. Now we can apply, hey, this is an outside um, mutual aid partner's run time that's key coded um, through the CAD that I can assign that unit to that call now. And I have the ability now to, to to even see what my mutual aid partners' response times are into our jurisdiction, which is, which really became powerful and was a was a really good point for us when we went through our last accreditation process, um, and it was our first time going through for reaccreditation, uh, to be able to show that that was a change from the previous go around where we didn't have access to the data. You know, we talked about at the beginning not having that access. And we kind of got a pass. I don't want to say got a pass, but they understood, you know, is that baby steps and we've grown along this way. So now we have the ability to show what we're receiving aid, um, you know, in the form of an ambulance, but now I can show you what that is. Um, and so as, you know, times change or if, you know, there ever becomes a need where, hey, we may need to transport or we can say we don't need to transport because, our mutual aid partners providing an ambulance within the time frame we deem acceptable or you deem acceptable. Now I can show it, you know, right. and that just becomes huge for the organization. Michael, you meant you used the term curate data. So there, there's the outlier policy where if you have a, a wild card that went off somewhere, you have the ability to remove that from the, from the analysis. It, when you say curate, I've also heard the term clean data explain Explain what that is about. Like, what does that mean? Oh, man, there's again, it's <laughs> I guess it's to boil it down. I guess I would make it say scientifically because you can never through any of what I'm going to say is it going to be like fudging numbers. Right. But I would say scientifically, how do you get from what where you're at to what you trust or what you feel is the most accurate or the 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 best records if you can. Right. So, again, there's there's a bunch of different ways you could take it. But, you know, there's. Or do do I look like I have the right amount of uh, EMS calls versus structure fire calls from one year to the next? Does that seem to be consistent, or is there so much variance that that's wrong? Um, do uh, do my well, unit types look like they have the same you know proper amount of runs, or are my my engines going on consistent amount of runs uh, from year to year? Uh, you know, of course, it's going to have. A little bit of wiggle in there, but if you got ten thousand one year and two thousand the next year, probably jump out to unless it's twenty twenty, probably jump out to that something's off here, right? So you wouldn't trust it. Back to step two of my process, I guess. Um, how you how you do that is <laughs> you can go a bunch of different ways, right? But I'd say, um, generally speaking, you use your best judgment to yeah. scientifically. Uh, keep everything you're working with trustworthy, right? We're, you can't ever fudge numbers or anything like that. But, you know, and here's an example, right? We used um, we used the outlier policy because that's an easy one, right? I think that you probably need to have some sort of command level meeting and have a, an agreement saying, okay, what do we think should be thrown out? Not to make our numbers look better, but because it's truly some sort of anomaly. Right. And you might need to do research to refine that out. Like, OK, how many times a year do we have call processing over an hour long? How often does that happen? So it's um, there's a lot of different uh, ways to go with it. OK. And then, you know, it, again, I hate it. I just keep going down different routes. But do we throw out our outlier data or do we need to hold on to that? Right. Do, do we need to keep it so we can say, all right, well, we had this happen five times last year with the hour long call processing. It happened 30 times this year. Is that on us or is that some sort of soft problem? 
again, the general process of do I trust this? Is it scientific? It, it, am I comfortable making operational decisions or reporting or whatever it is off of this? How do we get to where I trust it? That's the general philosophy. I would say there's there's so much, uh, I guess, different routes you could take that as far as specific tech cleansing strategies. But outliers a big one. Number of uh, events or records or different natures is a big one. Having you know, not to get into the very specifics of the records, but what what are the what are the big timestamps? So like call received, uh, dispatch, in route, on scene, clear, hospital. Do you, do you, are you have do you, are you having any trouble with you know we've got ten thousand incidents a year but we only have five thousand turnouts right so yep. yeah yeah so that's you you bring up like when we talk about like at the very beginning one of the things when we talk about you know and I, and call processing will always kind of be in my mind is we had that outlier policy and we had to develop one of like what are we going to exclude and that actually is where we identified that we had a call processing challenge. I don't want to say it's a problem, just a challenge because we hadn't been looking at it um, in that kind of detail is we had that exact thing is we might have had, let's say, three or four thousand on scene times for EMS for a medical call. We may have only had half of that for call processing time because our outlier was three minutes. Anything over three minutes we had excluded. And we're like, well, why are we have this number so low? Well, we found out that there was a good portion that were in like the three minutes, the three minutes and 15 seconds, you know, and I, and, and without going back and they were just outside that realm. Be, and we found that that was, that was a challenge. And we used that, you know, and looked at our, you know, one adjust our outlier policy, but two found that we have an issue. And then we, then we really got our true 90th percentile. We're like, Oh, we need to build some different stuff to change everything. So, um, you know, so so you building those policies, having those set in stone, will help you. You know, find find things you may not have been aware of. Awesome. I, I think that's a big step for departments that are that are just starting on the journey to understand what that process. You know, what to look for, even. Yeah. Uh, assuming you can access your information, then understand what you're initially looking at. I think is an important step to uh, get off on the right foot, so to speak. Yeah. Can I just say one more thing? And you don't yeah. mind. Yeah. So I I didn't go to college for this or anything, but I think that if you did go to college for it, there if no one's ever heard of it, you know, and there's someone out there who hasn't, it's it simply boils down to garbage in, garbage out. Like you have to have good, trustworthy inputs to have a good, trustworthy output. It's as simple as that. Yeah. And that's what I would impart on, you know, to our guys when we have training is, you know, we have to put that filling out that report. You're tired at three in the morning. I have been there. Lord knows I have been, but to make sure that it's done because it's such, it only does us a disservice, not only just not doing the report, but it does a disservice five years, you know, a couple of years later um, when that could be the call, you know, especially on, on our key calls, right. That, you know, to be able to pull up that information, um, you know, even putting a dollar loss versus save, that's our outcome, right. You know, especially if you're looking at fires, well, what was that property worth? It was Target. You know, it was a big box store worth multiple millions of dollars. And there was a tractor trailer in the loading dock that was on fire. And we put out a tractor trailer. And yeah, you know, we lost a tractor trailer, but we didn't lose Target. We didn't lose Walmart. That's a huge win for an organization. That's something to be proud of. You did It did not spread. It did not get beyond. And that's a testament to the, the, the men and women of the, the service that went out and actually put boots on the ground. But then filling out that report accurately so that we can use that information um, when we're talking to our community leaders to show what the fruits of their labor are, you know, because obviously we're an expensive industry and there's a cost of doing business, whether it's salaries and equipment and, and all the things that it takes to run a fire department to say, this is, this is why you, this is why you have our department. This is why we exist because we just, we prevented that loss to the community and, and a business partner and a focal point for, um, for everybody that lives there. It, it brings up an interesting point uh, culturally. We've, we've had some discussion uh, on this show over you know the last couple of episodes, ep two episodes, was um, looking at the culture of data collection in the fire service, of, of how do firefighters and company officers in particular approach or feel about 
this re- this report writing, you know, this this collecting of data, which is which is basically is. And I, I was once uh, in a situation where I heard of what was called the incomplete call report. It was a query of our RMS that showed how many uh, reports were incomplete or not started even. And uh, the list was, you know, I had to go walk outside and cool off for a minute because when I saw the, I'm like, how is this even possible? Because um, this is just insane. I, I, I'll give you credit if you got back at 4 a.m. and, you know, you got, you had to, you needed a minute, right? You didn't, you didn't complete the report until the next morning or something like that. I, I get all that. I'm not, I'm not saying that's uh, anything negative about that. But what I'm saying is if you didn't do the report at all, <laughs> you know, or, or it was incomplete in some way, I mean, that's like a basic company officer function. That's a, a darn right dereliction of duty in my brain, you know, in my book. Um, so it's interesting. What do you, what are y'all's thoughts on how the, the, do you see the culture evolving? Are you seeing that where you are? Is that a, is it just so, just where I was, or are you seeing something? No, like that? Um, we. Uh, it's funny you say that. We, that was that's another one of those things of that growth, right? Like our department grew. So again, um, non transport uh, fire based EMS. You know that that's our organization in a nutshell, um, and we're proud of our EMS program. But uh, previously, you know, on our medical director, and, and the expectation was, hey, we ran a medical call, and one of the ambulances from the private company stationed in our house, hey, they got on scene, cool, it's an EMS assist. I don't have to do a full PCR. And I was a paramedic firefighter at the time, and that was awesome. You loved running a call, and you're like, yes, that ambulance is with us, awesome. No PCR, just a quick Enver's report, name, and we're good. And we realized, we're like, well, that's not as we're doing this, and that was one of the things that came out of the first couple of years, well, how do we justify running all these medical calls when everything's an assist? We're assisting another agency. It's an EMS assist. Are we really needed? What's the purpose? And then we realize we're not capturing the information we need. Well, we save this person's life. Well, no, you didn't. You assisted them. You assisted something. What is that? And that's that garbage in, garbage out. So, And that was a big culture change for us. And credit to our, our current EMS captain, um, we both actually started on the same day. So now we're both, you know, one's fire, one's EMS, and uh, we're like the stepbrothers here. But, you know, credit to him that that was one of his big campaigns of like, hey, we have to change this. We're we're going there. We're going there for a medical call. It's a medical call. And we're going to treat it as a medical call. And we're going to document those, get that report done so we can pull that information out so we can justify the need for new monitors, new well, laryngoscopes, us carrying these different medications, you know, whatever, whatever program we decide. Um, and, and the same thing for like, you know, our, our Enfers, you know, reporting is we've had to change that culture. Uh, and so much so that things weren't getting done or coded correctly that we, we made a line in the sand, you know, um, probably about five years ago that, hey, um, company officers are going to be responsible for that Enfers report and a company officer is going to actually do that report not somebody else um, and not doing, you know, and not being able to delegate that that's the company officer's responsibility that that gets done. Um, And then we check, you know, so we do a a weekly reconciliation, you know, with our our CAD data and our RMS system to see if there's any outstanding reports where somebody may not have uploaded it from the CAD. So it doesn't show as complete because we have to import from our CAD. It doesn't automatically push to our, our RMS system. And to make sure, well, yeah, we had, you know, 200 calls for service. We only have 198 reports. Cool. Well, hey, you guys missed two reports. And then he um, does a detailed one every month to make sure that, hey, if we have, you know, 50 or 60, you know, 321s, which is just our standard medical call, you know, encoding, that we have the associated medical reports to go with that. So at when we do a detailed analysis every year, we're not aware of all these reports. Um, and that's one of the things we've been, you know, on the back end that it's taken us several years. There was definitely a lot of resistance and pushback, but ultimately that's, that's why we have what we have now, um, is, is, is building those programs. And now it's, it's more an exception if somebody doesn't get one of those PCRs and it's more, Hey, you need to go back and do that. You code it, you know, that's part of the job. And I would venture to say that doing that has saved several people. When it comes to depositions, court cases, you know, a question or a complaint, you know, any of those things. And uh, I always remember um, he's retired now, but he always said, my pen, my paper, my story. And getting that through people's heads, is, that report is your chance to document what you did. We did the work. You know, you went there, you did the call, you got the merit badge. Give yourself credit by doing a report, giving that information 
um, and, and basically validating what you just did. So if it's not documented, it didn't happen. Yeah. Um, I'm probably not the, the target demographic to answer this, right? Cause I've never been a, a fireman, uh, never worked in the industry. Um, I'm one project manager at one company, right? And I would say I get to, I'm lucky enough to be in the position that I'm going to make this number up, but it's something around this. Like I probably look at the public safety data that covers like 40 million Americans or something. So to answer your question is like it, a lot of people have had to really care before it ever gets to me. So I would say, you know, care about doing this, what I think is the right way. Um, I would say that if you don't seem to care or you're the people in charge of the organizations kind of seem like they're, they do more often now than not. Right. Very true. Now you, you guys have, uh, you, you piqued my interest because I heard in your, uh, in the beginning of the episode, you were talking about some kind of more tactical related data points that you capture there. Um, a little bit beyond the air break, right? That's, that's my, that's my, my thing. I'm, I'm excited about what we can learn about actual tactical operations uh, beyond arrival. And, and I know y'all work as a team on a regular basis, right? Have y'all found anything uh, where you, you were looking at those tactical, um, tactical issues that maybe caused you to change the way you operate or tweak uh, your tactical guidelines in some way? Have you learned something from, from that capturing that data and analyzing it? Um, so, we're, so this is for us, like that's, that's the area we're going to work on. Like, you know, we all have goals, you know, for the next five years. And that's one of those things that hey, in the infancy, and I think even Michael and I had kind of discussed is that's going to be where we, that's our next step. That's our, that is our next step for building. Anecdotally, we see like, oh, well, if we, our training programs, our guys, you know, and, and I'll use um, some extrication. I've got two, two good examples for this is previously our organization, we had to do extrication training to get guys with their hands on tools to learn how to fire it up, how to actually operate, how not to injure themselves, you know, proper body mechanics. And now because our jurisdiction is so busy, we're running multiple extrications a week, you know, and now we're doing our extrication trains are geared towards the weird stuff because in Florida, we actually have hills and steep grades and stuff. And most of everything else in Florida is flat except for here. Um, and we have basements and ravines and drop-offs and low angle rescues because the car goes off into a ditch and now they have to extricate 30 feet below grade um, in a storm drain, you know, and that happens nowhere else in this state. Um, but it's something that's unique to our jurisdiction. And now we're able to, to train on that because we've had the extrication and so much so that um, we actually use that data um, to purchase an additional set of extrication for one of our units that didn't have it because they were housed at a, you know, that at a dual unit station where they only, we only had enough for extrication on one. And now it actually, they, they're they still in the box. They arrived a couple of days ago. And so, you know, in, in the next couple of weeks, all of our units will have extrication because we were able to show that we're running these types of walls and we need this on every single vehicle, especially when we have units out of training, you know, vice versa. Um, so that's that's been huge for us. Um, and, and on that tactic side of like, we, we've been able to use that to gear or change. Um, I just thought of a third example. And so um, one of our surf, uh, one of our other service programs is surface water, surface water rescue. We have a swim program. Um, it's taken us about 10 years to get to this point. Um, and now 80 percent of our department's actually a certified rescue swimmer. Um, meeting, you know, the NFPA guidelines for that. And we do a test and they're incentivized and everything else. And we're now running more surface water rescue calls than structure fires. Legitimate, putting swimmers in the water, rescuing victims um, and, and getting there. Uh, and we have two boats between four stations and they're getting used on a regular basis. And we can show that. And it was awesome to be able to have that data because uh, our city manager was challenged when, Somebody was doing a budget review of like, well, why do they need this surface water rescue year for a new engine that we're ordering? Mm -hmm. And it and it was out of, you know, and, and it is a joke, like out of, let's just say, you know, several hundred thousand dollars. This was only a two or three thousand dollar line item. But they're like, well, why do they need that? They don't need dive equipment. And the city manager and the fire chief were able to basically say, this is how many water rescue calls. This is what it does. This is the impact that it makes. And it became a non-issue instantly. Um, so that and that's driving our tactical decisions of. 
what we identified with even those surface water rescue calls to say, well, what do you need? Our current dispatch water rescue call, it's a single engine. They notify a, a shift commander. They notify a battalion and that's county one. We've identified that it's at a minimum, a four unit response with three guys because you need two swimmers. You need two on the rescue. You need a shift commander. Somebody's got to go get the Marine unit. And then we're going to probably go get another Marine unit because we have one that can be put in the big lake and it's a big boat if there needs to be tow. And then we have a Zodiac that can get deployed. And so it basically almost becomes a structure fire response. And so we're going to be looking at changing that on the initial run cards. That if a water rescue comes in, units are denoted in the CAD of having a rescue swimmer or surface water capability. And then we change our dispatch parameters based on what we found with the anecdotal evidence and then our programs and knowing what resources need for those type of calls. Um, so those are the tactical decisions that have been driven by data in our collection um, that are that are affecting our operations. Um, so, so it's huge. That's awesome. It, Michael, I was, I was going to, so we talked about kind of data on the, the, at the beginning and up kind of through the accreditation process and such, but I also wanted to kind of shine a light on what, where, where, what's possible, right? Like what's, um, what's interesting. Is there, like, I know we were talking about diminishing returns the other day. Like when you look at deployment, like you can put so much stuff in the field, but at some point you start to, it's, it starts to become inefficient. Like, can you tell us a little bit about what that looks like? Yeah, for sure. Do you want to talk about what's possible or diminishing returns? Well, both. I mean, whatever you think is yeah. better. What's, what's possible? Sure. Would, is sure. Kind of well, the way. reason I asked, unfortunately, is all right. So I've been doing specifically, you know, pub fire, EMS, and a little bit of police, public safety work for like six years now, right? It, it sounds weird. I always tell, you know, everyone I work with, like, this is going to sound like a weird sales pitch, but it's almost like there's always a new spin. There's always something, a twist, right? Some, And I, the best part of this job, honestly, is I get to talk to professionals like Captain Kastler, and I get to take and learn, and I get to apply at people I see across the country, you know, same problem sets, right? That's the best part. Another good part is I get to see how they go about tackling problems or how they view it or what's the next level of a problem, right? So I'll try to be as general as I can here because I said all of that to really say that there's so many specific. We literally, like, I'm pretty sure if you ask me to like go through every specific tactical decision that I think I learned about departments across the United States sitting in my office just through data, then I could probably talk for two hours. So I'll be very general as I can here, right? I would say, you know, we, like you said, data, maybe we're chasing accreditation or something, or maybe we're whatever, we're just getting started with data. So we don't even know what we uh, are, are really chasing yet. We just know we got to get better, something like that. The implied to me, first step of that is, well, once you have this historical aspect, you can study yourself, right? So yeah, the whole time Captain Castle was talking, I was like, you don't have to make it very far into this process before you can start getting some tactical returns. Again, I'm, I'm, I don't know anything about being what it's like to be a fireman in the day to day, and I'm not, I'm not some Ivy League educated data scientist either. But somehow you look, you know, you get comfortable enough. I learn a lot about everyone's tactical decisions and where I think. They could do a little better just looking at spreadsheets like Captain Kassler say, right? Once you kind of learn what you're looking for and stuff. So either way, that to me, the important part there, though, is not early in the process, right? I said get your garbage in was kind of the first part or fix your garbage was the first part of this podcast. The second part is the output, right? It, early outputs, you should be able to study yourself, like Captain Kassler said, call processing, how are we performing, and then boom, they learned, Right. Or, uh, you know, how we're responding in certain parts of our service area versus others. It's easy, easy to see. It's, it's a matter of fact, if you will. You know what I mean? Uh, and again, I'm not the professional. So I would think that the professionals, once they start looking, it really makes sense to them. Right. So there you, th th that's that's easy with accreditation. And um, not to say easy, but that's early in the process. Right. You can take that to the next level. Um once you have, not to, I mean, I'm going to steal this from one of these uh, Ivy, League, Ivy League educated people that I work with. But once you have enough variables, you can take it to the next level and you could build a predictive model. Right. That's that's pretty good. So everything we've talked about before is what is the reality? 
let's talk about what if. All right. That opens an infinite number of doors, more or less. So uh, what if we get told to shut down? Like, what's the impact going to be? Right. You know, all this stuff, you know, where your calls are, who usually responds, how long it takes, who goes, you know, all these different things along the way. The next step would just be to uh, build a system, a decision making system off of that. And unfortunately, I can't really go into the details of everything that would be required for that. It's not the point of this today, I don't think. But, uh, you know, that's another way you could take it. So that would be big picture, uh, command level decisions, strategic decisions, if you will. Uh, But you could take it. You could take it another way. Right. You could study. All right. Well, you know, we rolled out the this resource and we didn't really get the uh, the desired impact that we thought we would. You know, why is that? Right. So you can make some tactical level decisions even and you could say, all right, well, you know, they sat around. They didn't. It's supposed to be a peak time ambulance and they didn't get a call for two hours. So we know we missed the mark. So what can we do about it? Well, who around needed help at the time? Right. And is there a way that we can kind of get that implemented in real time? That's another uh, kind of a tactical way that all this work on the front end, you can make these high level important decisions, but you have to do all the work on the front end to get to that point. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think it's amazing. Um, the ability to get into the what if side of the house uh, and test scenarios, I think, is that's when you really start to get ahead, get ahead of, of, you know, come into your proactive own active versus reactive. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It, it, I know one of the things we used to struggle with before I retired was uh, we had two different response zones. We had a, a suburban service area and a rural service area, and they had different response goals for each one. And, you know, the without some sort of predictive analytics tool, you're just guessing, yeah. <laughs> you know, as to what if we made it, what if we made them all one? How would that look? Yeah. Unless you can run the modeling, you don't have any yeah. idea. So yeah. any, um, any closing thoughts, guys, captain, you got anything you want to uh, share with the group before we, uh, before we part out of here? So I think it's just, you know, like you said, is people is don't be afraid to take that dive. Um, there's going to be mistakes. There's going to be things like um, that you see that you may not necessarily like about your organization, or you're going to find some of those un- unexpected things, but that's okay. That's part of the process, right? Like that's that self-improvement. That's the reason we're doing this is to ultimately affect and deliver a better product um, is, but you're never going to get to that end product if you don't take that first step um, and, and not, not to, not to let it overwhelm you, not to let it be this scary thing. Cause it's really not. Um, you know, if I could figure it out as a firefighter and slowly build my way and then there, and there's, there's another one of me at every, there's, there's one of me at every agency. Uh, and, um, it's as for leaders is finding those people early too, of like, Hey, this guy is really good with that and bringing them in and starting to show that. Um, and it gets guys focused on that, you know, um, you know, turnout times and the why and, and providing that information. Um, because I think we're, you know, as firefighters and, and, to you know, military, we're mission driven. You know, if our goal is to get this and we know this is the mission, this is the why, this is what it's going to do, then we're all for it. And this, everything we've talked about basically helps drive that mission home. Um, it's just, we now have technology to help that. And, uh, you know, and that's, that's really all, you know, it's that full circle. Um, so just don't be afraid, take that first step and get involved. Um, and, and understand the power of what we're doing. Absolutely. Michael, any, any last thoughts? I couldn't say it any better, man. It just to circle back to the beginning, like it works and it's worth it. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time, both of you to be on the show today. It's, it's been very insightful for me and I'm sure for our audience, they, we greatly appreciate it and very impressed with what you've done there. Claremont, man, the, my hat's off to the, to the team there and, and the officers and chief and really done some tremendous work over the last year. So congratulations on that. Oh, thank you. And yeah. And uh, if you, if, for, if you're looking for more information on this podcast, we're always here on fire engineering. You can find us on YouTube. We're on blog talk radio. Uh, you can find me and the show on uh, Facebook. We have a fire service data and tech talk Facebook page. You can reach me there if you have ideas for the show or comments and it's at data tech talk on Twitter at data tech talk. So I appreciate everybody spending the time to to listen to us today. I hope you have a great uh, holiday summer season, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.
Fire Service Data and Tech Talk.